There are two things taking place in this episode that is important to take note of. One is going to be building contours and taking our figure to its ultimate dimensions from four views. We'll talk about that soon. The other is going to be internal drawing and I want to start with that this time. Drawing internally simply means that where there is clay representing a width, we draw on information that is to be found in between those widths. For example, here from the front, I have the width to draw on the abdominal wall or the six pack or the belly, if you will. And so I should do that. I have the room to separate the abs from the obliques. And so I should do that in the drawing as well. When I move on to the side view, there is no telling where the contours are placed in depth. So this internal drawing allows me to solve this issue before it becomes a problem. I will already know and have clear drawn marks to indicate where the contours need to sit in space when I move to the next view. Your time should probably be split between drawing internally and building contours in the beginning. A sculpture with contours and no eternal internal drawing is very limited in terms of how it can progress. In that situation, the contours exist in isolation, and in isolation, they don't do as much for you as they could if we included internal drawing. The work, your work, will seem abstract and therefore be difficult to read and understand if you don't have internal drawing. And this is a typical problem. Students won't be able to make decent comparisons between their reference and their work because the two are too far apart visually. It's a tough dichotomy to balance as making your sculpture look like the reference often will sacrifice flexibility too soon. Internal drawing and building contours in unison helps solve this issue. Okay, time to talk about a big part of this process. The contours or the building of the contours. With good structure set up and good heights established, we have something to build contours on and in between. This makes building them much easier. We use the word contour here to describe the outline of the body because silhouette doesn't properly describe the fact that the outline of the body moves back and forth in depth from any given views. Contours does describe this phenomenon. Contours does simply mean building the outline of the body from four separate views. Doing so is going to solve more issues than you would think and it will allow us to turn the forms into volumes as well later on. The idea that you need to work your sculpture from every 360 degree angle is a bit overrated and frankly a little bit absurd I think. It's also not very practical which is sort of a big deal. Four views is a practical approach and by using the four sides of our box as flat planes we observe from, we can always get perfectly back to our original four views. This is important because it means that we can continue to improve and reiterate on our contours and our decision making. If we can't get back to the same front view multiple times, for example, then we are likely to be making changes that simply need to be made because we are not observing from the same view as before. So we end up chasing our tails in circles. Observing from the same view many times over and over matters a lot in terms of improving and not going in circles, and it will reduce the amount of frustration that you feel while working. In more extreme poses where there is a twist between the pelvis and the ribcage and we don't have the same front plane to the pelvis and the ribcage, we will need to observe them both from four separate views, essentially eight views, that gets really complicated, however, so and we don't need to do that with the sculpture that we have in front of us here. So for now, let's stick with the box or the pelvis being the thing, the object that we orient our four views from. I work around the pelvis first because here I am the least likely to have made any mistakes in regards to heights. It's sort of a safe haven in that sense, if you will, and most often I'll start any new step of the process there or here, if you will, be because of this. I work outwards from the center of my sculpture and the center of my decision making, this center being the pelvis. I work down into the legs, notably only into the standing leg for now, the balanced leg we will deal with a little bit later. And I also work up into the torso. I try to always maintain a connection to what came before. For example, I'm not going to begin sculpting at the top of the ribcage without having worked the contours at the bottom of the ribcage. This is because if worked in isolation, something is bound to go wrong proportionally. 
Everything is connected, and so I try to work this way. Don't sculpt a hand at the end of an arm without sculpting the arm first, for example. You're bound to have proportional errors doing things this way, and that means sculpting something twice, which is annoying, of course. While perhaps hard to believe, at first glance, there is a lot of symmetry in the body. The distance from the center line out to the contours is symmetrical on either side, no matter the pose. The bumps that make up the contours are very symmetrically placed, perpendicular to the center line of whatever bony mass we're working on. This means that working on one side without working on the other side is sort of a mistake. I always work both sides at the same time. Both sides of the contour more or less at the same time, and not just one side at a time. Of course the clay is applied to one side then to the other, but the idea is that it's the overall dimensions that matters, and it's much easier to deal with those if I make sure that I have symmetry on either side of the center line. If there is symmetry, it's better to work with it in mind. So, if there is symmetry, work symmetrical. There is much more symmetry than you might think there is, and try to look for it and not look for an excuse to have less of it, especially in these early stages. Less symmetry often ends up in a place where the figure looks structurally really weak and too much like a wet noodle. Not only is there symmetry in width, symmetry in the design of the contours themselves, there is also symmetry in the design of the internal information. Remember that when you draw internally, there is a lot of symmetry which makes sense once we think about it. The muscles are probably, well, they are, attached in the same place on either side of the center line, so it makes sense that the bottom of the pectoral muscles, for example, are symmetrical in height perpendicular to the center line running through the ribcage. That's because the pectoral muscles are, of course, attached at the same rib on either side of the center line. This brings up a point that I probably should have mentioned a bit earlier. This trick of symmetry only works when there is the same thing happening on either side of the body. So, from views where we have a center line, essentially. This means the front and the back view, and it of course only applies to the torso. The torso being the pelvis and the ribcage. And the head, too. We won't have a center line running down the side view, and the front and the back of the body, when observed from the side, are obviously different. There are not abs on the back and no shoulder blades in the front. This concept of structural symmetry also doesn't apply to limbs, because they are different on either side, though it does apply to the head, which is considered the third bony mass, and of course also needs to be structurally sound. Contours doesn't exist in isolation. They are not something that is different from, from anything else. They're not something unique. They are part of the anatomy, and when we turn our sculpture to the next view, the side view, the contours we built are going to become inter internal information. The abdomen we drew on, which was internal from the front, becomes contour from the side. Always keep this in mind. Contours are just part of the anatomy, and the convexities in the contours are muscle forms and sometimes fat deposits. This means that they are the same thing as what we, drew, as, as what we draw internally, and they do not exist in isolation. A great way to get a figure with a convincing sense of anatomy is to make sure that the contours are connected to the internal drawing. A part of the contour travels along the contour for a while, before it's going to travel into the body and become part of the internal information. Anytime you see a negative angle break, meaning an angle break sort of heading into the body, not one at the peak of a form, you can assume that it's the form making up the contour beginning to travel into the body and a new form is going to take over the contour at the other side of that negative angle break. In drawing, this would be dealt with as an overlap, and it's the trick that is going to make sure that your drawings on paper has a sense of what is in front and what sits behind. So, this gives an otherwise flat line drawing the illusion of three dimensions and depth, for example. Apply the same line of thinking here in sculpture, but also always connect the contour to a part of the internal drawing. This way, it's just not random shapes floating around the body, but an interconnected web of forms and shapes, which makes up our anatomy as humans.
Here is an image of a sculpture I made, and here are a bunch of places where there are overlaps and parts of the contours traveling into the figure and becoming internal information. Hopefully you can see that doing this will help a lot with the believability of your figures.